Hello everyone, welcome to Chris's Classic Cinema. My name is Chris Wired and this is my good friend. Hi, I'm Jacob Nemus. Welcome to another episode of Chris's Classic Cinema. So, last time we talked about disaster films. Now this time, we're going to deal with a certain director who was known for making a lot of big westerns of his time. I am talking about John Ford. Now John Ford was a big director. He still has the record for the most Academy Award wins for Best Director. Four. That's even more than Steven Spielberg. Crying shame. It's criminal. Yeah, and one of them he actually famously beat Orson Welles for his, for his movie Citizen Kane. Also a crime. Yeah. Yeah, the four movies he won was for the 1935 film Der The Informer, 1940s film adaptation of John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, then a year later, it was the film that beat Citizen Kane for Best Picture, How Green Was My Valley. And then in 1952, it was for the rom-com The Quiet Man. We're not doing any of those. Instead, we're doing like the, the genre that he was most famous for, westerns. And when it comes to most of them, they included, what is, they included the Duke, John Wayne. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a little bit of a PSA. There is going to be some uh, pretty unsavory imagery throughout all four of these movies. Uh, we do not agree with that imagery whatsoever, and we just want to say that this is these are just movies, right? And so. this was around the time when it was the whole cowboys versus Indians thing, and nowadays p cancel culture will be taking them out like that. That being said, let's talk about our first film. We're actually going to start with a film that put his name on the map. We're actually going back a hundred years ago to 1924 with a film that takes place around the time of the Transcontinental Railroad. We already reviewed one movie around that time, Cecil B. DeMille's Union Pacific, but this one, The Iron Horse. Two childhood friends find themselves again during the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Meanwhile, the man who wants to fulfill his father's dream of building the railroad over a valley unfortunately has to deal with a greedy landowner who is wanting to do everything he can to keep the railroad on his territory not only that there's some other side plots as well we all, of course deal with another harem of course and not only that but this greedy two-fingered landowner is also the man that may have done some really naughty acts <laughs> yeah we're not I saying what i'm not spoiling that now what when it comes to this film, I actually thought it was interesting. I mean, I mean I've already seen Union Pacific, but when it comes to seeing this movie, it's definitely a lot different than Union Pacific. Yeah, there are quite a few parallels that can be drawn. Um, for example, uh, The Iron Horse actually was one of the first movies, if not the first movie, to really popularize the Transcontinental Railroad to a whole new generation. And uh, when it comes to like some of the sets, they wanted to make them as realistic as possible. Mm -hmm. And since this was a silent film, they they used a lot of titles for and which made it seem more like a documentary, like yes. you said earlier. Yes, there is a there. It, it makes it, it the spacing of the title cards uh, gives it a much more documentary feel. Plus, the title cards are stayed up on the screen quite a bit longer than on a lot of silent films simply because uh, the literacy rate wasn't that high back then. So they kept this, them on a little longer, so the movie may feel a little bit drawn out to some. I mean, the movie is about two and a half hours long. Yes. Now, <laughs> when it comes to the cast, let's talk about the two leads. George O'Brien and Maj Bellamy. Mm -hmm. They play two, two childhood friends who meet each other again after a couple of years. And you can tell there's a bit of chemistry between them. There is definitely a lot of chemistry between them. And the two actors were very legendary in their own right for a lot of silent films, but unfortunately they weren't the actors who kind of made the transition properly to sound. I don't blame them. In fact, there's a lot of uh, really, really good casts. There's actually a really strong cast in this movie for the time, but most of them didn't really quite make the transition to sound, unfortunately. And like Union Pacific, there's a love triangle oh, yes. with, the, with the girl's fiance. Yes, yes, who happens to be a, one of the men who are plotting the route for the, uh, for the Transcontinental Railroad. Yeah, and he, you can definitely tell he's jealous of the guy. Yes, yes. 
And the guy, he, he's a very gung-ho person. He's a part of the Pony Express. He's also trying to hunt down the guy who killed his dad. Yes. Yes, and uh, it, it, a lot of different small elements to the movie. And I think I enjoyed it more for the historic aspect of it because it actually almost got more right, historically speaking, than the Union, than Union Pacific. You know, they took a lot less liberties. Um, they took a lot less liberties of stretching the truth than with Union Pacific. Yeah, but there are some tidbits here and there that aren't accurate. There is only really one I've noticed, maybe two. The and big one would be right at the finale with the, with the completion of the railroad. The, the title cards claim that the trains used are the real trains, but they're not. No, they are the same class of locomotives, and they are period correct, but they aren't the actual locomotives themselves. They just changed the livery of the locomotives to make it more authentic. Yeah. Now let's talk about the main villain. I mean, the first time you see him, he's in this huge fur coat. Oh, yes. Yes, it has to obstruct the view of the arm. Yes, and he also has a very, you can tell he has a, he wants that sense of power yes. when it comes to the railroad because if it can, he believes that if it can get the railroad through his territory, that means more money. Well, yes, because they have to buy it, the, of that piece of land, for, you know, the government would have to buy that land off him. And then there's also some side characters, like this bunch of guys who are friends with the main character, with the main protagonist. They have some sort of comic relief in to them. Yeah, there is a little bit of comic relief to them. Uh, actually, that's probably one of the more realistic portions of the movie, is the, uh, some of the shops that we see throughout the film in Cheyenne. One of them is a bar that's also a courthouse. The other one is a dentist that's also a, a barbershop. <laughs> Yeah, and and that was actually kind of that was pretty common back then for uh, men to you know. Yeah, and then there's that one guy that was scared stiff of getting his tooth pulled out. Oh yeah, that was actually a really funny portion. I really liked that. Or the point where uh, during the accused uh, in the murder trial scene, um, they uh, brought up a uh, a law that was done a couple years prior, and uh, I, it has a very funny name in it that I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> But it's in all caps on my notes right below us. Yeah, but along with that, there's also that uh, one lady who's basically a prostitute. Yes, that's who I'm referring to. The prostitute was the one that was accused of uh, committing murder. And then the trial was ruled as an attempted suicide. <laughs> and then there's that guy that wants to do, that's basically the law make, the law graver and the judge. He's just... Yes, fantastic, very flamboyant. I love that character. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Now when it comes to production, this was big, and oh, this yeah. was around the time when silent films were still trying to get that sense of epic scale. I mean, a year before, Cecil B. DeMille did his original version of the Ten Commandments. A year later, there would be MGM would do a full film adaptation of Ben Hur, which was very, which was one of the biggest films of the 1920s. Yeah, you know, and of course, in typical grandeur fashion, it did go over budget considerably, actually. Yeah, and. Uh, I mean, there's cast of thousands, there's full-size sets, elaborate costumes. It, it, they even brought in several workers from the Transcontinental Railroad, like the actual Transcontinental Railroad, because a lot of them were still alive. They brought them on set for cameo appearances. There was, this was, I mean, when it comes to like when it was completed, it was a, about a 50-year span. Yes, so a lot of the people that would have worked on the Transcontinental were actually still alive and well. And yeah, were able to make cameo appearances, and it was mainly minority groups that made the cameo appearances. Yeah, and when it comes to cinematography, I thought Fantastic. it was really good. Yeah, it was the I think it was the first movie to actually. Oh, was it, was it the first movie to feature Monumental Valley? I don't think so. Oh, it was not okay. I know that there, were, but when it comes to like the on-site locations, they chose some awesome sites. They sure did. They sure did, and oh, all in the south, southern, western, you know, southwest. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the particular Native Americans, it's aged badly. It has aged badly. I think in this case, it's aged a bit better for this particular movie. Um, they are portrayed as savages who are just there to wreak havoc and try and reclaim their land. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to that whole th that whole climax with the battle between them and the pe and the cit the town citizens. Yes, yes. I don't even want to go into that too much. Yeah, this movie does have some 
some pretty good action scenes in it. It does. It does have some pretty uh, strong action scenes in it. Uh, and of course, this is pre-code. There would be those strong action scenes where they weren't. It, there was no fear of offending, or there was no fear of going too far. Yeah, and like I said, this was a this was a silent film, so it would take a lot of patience to be able to watch a movie this long. Yeah, uh, I mean, you were able to handle Metropolis last time. I was able to handle Metropolis. That's not as long as a film. That's not as nearly as long. It's about ten minutes shorter, I think. Um, Whereas with this film, you know, and Metropolis is more of the kind of genres I'm into, whereas Westerns, not so much. Um, again, it's all about the pacing. I didn't really care for the pacing of this movie too much. It felt a little slow. It had to be, but it, it did feel a little slow. Yeah, well, well, when it comes to those epic films of that time, they didn't... Some of them did have that problem with pace. Yeah. They wanted to try to get him as much story as they could without boring the audience. Yeah, and you know, and their way of, and I feel like the way that they um, prevented that with this film was to have the harem. You know, I felt like the harem was almost put in as an afterthought versus an actual being part of the movie. Yeah. Well, all I can say is that when it comes to the Iron Horse, it was it was a financial success at the box office. According to Wikipedia, it it earned like over three times its budget. Oh wow, that's pretty good for that. Yeah, but it wasn't like one of the highest grossing films of that year. But now it's now it's part of the National Film Registry in yeah. the Library of Congress. Yeah, it earned the registry, I believe, in '97. No, it was more recent actually. Yeah. And uh, the reason it won it got it's in the Library of Congress at all is because it was the first movie to kind of reintroduce the Transcontinental Railroad to a whole new generation of people. And John Ford did a pretty good job of that in my book. A very good job of it, yes. Yeah, and he already directed a lot of silent films before this, but this was the one that basically made him the West the guy to do Western films. Mm -hmm. And he would go on to do quite a few more uh, silent Western films for quite a while. Until the transition to sound. Yeah, and then he would take a break for a while. Yeah. All in all, what would you give this movie? Uh, I'm going to give it a, probably a two and a half. Not because it's a bad movie, but the movie is aged to the point now where it's, unless you're an actual diehard film enthusiast, it's going to be difficult to enjoy. I'm going to give it maybe three and a half. I mean, it could have been much better in my book. But for what it is, it's a it's an okay western. Yeah. I mean, there there are worse there are worse films than this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There there are, and, and, you know, and of course that's partly due to age, though. I think a lot of it of my lower rating has to do with the age of the film more than anything. I mean, like I said, I mean, this movie is about a hundred years old. It's even older than my grandparents. It's older than my great grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our take of the Iron Horse. Now we're going to be doing a jump, a year, a time jump, to 1939. What is? I already spoke this about this before when we did Union Pacific. 1939 is considered the greatest year in Hollywood because there was big movies like Gone with the Wind, The Wizard of Oz, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and then there's this film. Along with Union Pacific, this was a film that made West basically was a milestone for how people would make westerns. Oh yeah, it became an absolute blueprint for westerns for the next 30 years. And John Ford, this was another film that put him on the map. Oh yes. The film, Stagecoach. A group of strangers find themselves in a stagecoach in the middle of the Old West. A, a, one of them happens to be a fugitive cowboy who, hap, who is hunting down the, the men who killed his father and brother. Along with that, there's other characters like a prostitute who he starts falling in love with, a, a loyal wife who is on her way to meet her husband from the army. And is expecting. And there's also a, a gentleman who wants to protect the woman. Who, and then there's a guy that, there's an old banker who's, in, who, in, who's embezzling thousands of dollars in cash to get away from his wife. There's also the drunken uh, doctor who tags along as well, and then of course you have the marshal and the stagecoach driver. And there's also the that uh, wine expert who people keep mistaking for a reverend. Yep. Yep. No, he's a whiskey barrel runner. Yeah. Not a wine. Very, very different kind of liquor, whiskey and wine. Now when I first saw this, I really enjoyed it. Oh, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good film. 
I do like it myself. It's not a bad film. Yeah, I mean, like I said, like you said, this is basically one of the films that was a blueprint for westerns that we, as we know of today. Yes, this is probably the hallmark of all westerns because there's a, quite a few firsts here. This is the this is the second breakout film for John Wayne. This is the first time Monument Valley was used in any western. This was also the this was basically the second coming for Ford as well. This was basically Ford's second coming because. He hadn't done a Western in over a decade, not since the silent movie days. And a lot of production companies were actually a little bit nervous to try and take him on. He actually struggled to find a, pro a produ production studio to do the movie because he wanted John Wayne, and he also had been out of the game for a while. So a lot of people were very hesitant to allow him to do a movie and allow to allow this B-star movie. Yeah, I know, but at the time he was a B-star movie actor to do this. Yeah, when it comes to John Wayne, he plays the Ringo Kid. Yes. And he just, and he does an awesome job. He's, he, this was basically like the milestone for his career. This would make him the, the actor that we know him as in all his westerns. Yes, this is the point where uh, he goes from one of the, you know, one of the three musketeers that sings along in the, in the older westerns to, I am a grizzled man with a capital M. I'm here to, you know, steal women and kick kick butt. I'm also he's also on the trail to find the guys who killed his dad and brother mm -hmm. and he and he you can he's also on the he also is on the run too. On the run a, a very well-known gunslinger in his own right too. And he's actually friends with the sheriff who yeah, who actually feels kind of bad that he has to rearrest him. Yes, well he had to well he did escape from prison. Yeah. And then you have Claire Trevor as the prostitute who's basically getting kicked out of town by a bunch of old women who are basically the moral police. They are basically the moral police. Uh, think the same kind of women that uh, install prohibition. Yeah, those women. <laughs> exactly. And then you, I mean, and then you can tell there's a spark that starts to come between her and John Wayne. Yes. And she's reluctant at first, but she starts to grow. But their relationship start, starts to grow. And this movie only takes place in a few days. I don't think there was any reluctance in her part. I disagree. Well, she, her reluctance isn't the relationship between, isn't from the point of view of John Wayne or the Ringo Kid. Her attraction to Ringo Kid was immediate. The problem was, was her background. She was afraid of how he would react to her dark past of being a prostitute. That I can agree with. And then you have Thomas Mitchell as the drunk oh, doctor. Absolute legend. Absolute legend. I loved it. And 1939 was a huge year for Thomas Mitchell. He starred in so many movies. He was Scarlett O'Hara's dad in Gone with the Wind. He was one of the gypsies in the film version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame from that year. And when it comes to Stagecoach, the movie earned him the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. As it should have. He was absolutely amazing in that film. You know, uh, I, you, you know, for most of the movie, he's just this bubbling drunk. And then there are a couple of serious points in the movie, and even one scene that's comedic and towards the end of the film. Um, you know, some of my favorite scenes were uh, when he literally sobered up with a bunch of coffee and a couple slaps to the face in cold water. And he's like, all right, time to do this. You know, and this was just before he has to go deliver a baby. And yes, the baby that belongs to the to the woman who's wanting to reunite with her husband from the army. Yes. And then you had John Carradine as the gentleman who f goes along with her t because he wants to protect her. He he worked with her father in the military. Yeah, during the, when they were fighting in the Confederacy. Yes, and he was the southern gentleman. The southern gentleman and a gambler, you know. Yes, and, uh, and then you also have the banker who's embezzling like $50,000 in cash to yeah. get away from his wife. Oh yeah, who, oh by the way, was one of the women that chased the prostitute and the doctor out of town. And, when it comes to the banker, you can definitely tell how the much tension that is building on the way, because he's like, I don't want anyone to find out that I'm stealing all this cash. Well, at first he was a bit more nonchalant about it, but as the movie progressed, he was becoming more and more erratic in his behavior. Especially when, you know, shortly after birth, he's like, alright, time to go, and everybody's like, the woman just gave birth. Man, calm down. <laughs> Give it a day. Yeah, and then you have the, and then you have the guy who's the whiskey mm -hmm. expert. But, oh yes. And people keep 
mispronouncing his name. They keep thinking he's a reverend. Not only that, but he was very much quiet and everything. He was a, he was one of the more quiet, standoffish type. But again, his character began to grow a bit more bullish as the movie progressed. And then you have the cab driver who is very neurotic, especially with the idea of getting attacked by Native Americans. Oh, yeah, yeah. I actually found out that that guy was actually the original voice of Friar Tuck in Disney's Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, and that's another thing, too, is Geromino, who, Geromino, who was the main antagonist, one of the main antagonists of the film, uh, he was the lead Indian chief uh, war chief that was chasing after the stagecoach. A real person. Jeromino was an actual war chief from the time frame. That was an actual real person yes. that was being depicted. Yes, and when it comes to the portrayal of Native Americans, it hasn't aged. No. Yeah, good. You know, again, I think this is one of the better case scenarios in the case of Ford. Um, but the fact that he was able to draw from an actual Indian, a, a notorious Indian war chief from the time frame, it, it does show that he did do a little research and knew his stuff. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the production design, they did an awesome job. Oh, yeah. I mean, it just, the sets just scream Old West. The costumes are very authentic, and the cinematography is beautiful. Absolutely it's, amazing. I mean, especially the ways they show, they shot Monument Valley. Oh, yeah. That would become a staple for John Ford movies. He would use Monument Valley in almost all of his westerns. Yeah, basically every single one of them, and he wasn't the only one. It was the movie that popularized the film location. And it was actually a very unpopular little film location that wore first because of the really extreme weather and the long hours it took to kind of get everything set up and taken down. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the crew uh, and actors and actresses actually hated it because of how harsh the climate was. But now, but nowadays, whenever you see Monument Valley, you instantly think, this is the Old West. Exactly. And I know, I mean, there's even, I even found out that there's a hotel right on the location where you can just see that scenic shot of the, of the valley. I and wouldn't be surprised if that hotel is used more by Hollywood than anything else. Well, just, just to kind of rent out. And I also, I, I also know there's like a certain spot that that's marked because John Wayne would would love to be at that spot and just w watch the scene, scenery. Yep, yep. Yeah, and and the yeah, I mean the action sequences they are very good, and the stunts, man, they were really really good stunts for the time. Yeah, actually, the stunts were so good that some people even got injured. Like there were some actual authentic stunts that were almost too extreme. Yeah, and uh, when it comes to that one, that one stunt with the guy, that's that seems to get run over by the horses. That was a very popular stuntman at that time. His name was Yakima Canute. He, he actually was a stuntman. He was actually Clark Gable's stunt double in Gone with the Wind. Hmm. Yeah, during the Burning of Atlanta sequence. Oh, no kidding, all right. Yeah, that was one of the first scenes shot in the film and Clark Gable wasn't there, so they used Yakima Canute to take his place. All right, that one I didn't know. Yeah, he was a big stuntman of his time. And the stunts he does are, my God, you couldn't pay me to do that. Nope. nope. I would not. You could not pay me a million dollars to get run over by a bunch of horses and a stagecoach. And Those then you, are not have yeah. light vehicles. And then you have the climax when the Ringo Kid finally catches up with the guys he wants to shoot. It it, it just it basically was a mi the milestone of the shoot down. Oh yeah. And it's you know, most of it is done off scene, but immediately preluding that is um, my favorite scene in the whole movie, which is the drunken doctor uh, kind of standing up to the three gunmen and being like, I'll have you indicted if you walk out with that shotgun. With literally no badge, no gun, nothing, just immediately done it, and he's like, okay, fine. And then they all walk out without the gun, and the doctor tells the bartender, don't ever let me do that again. <laughs> Which I thought was amazing. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, that was great. Yeah, I mean, the cast in this is just... It's one of the best casts I've ever seen in a Western. Oh, yeah. And like I said, this was the same year as Union Pacific. Mm -hmm. And like Union Pacific, it was, a, it was a success at the box office. Wasn't one of the top ten highest, but it did receive seven Oscar nominations, including Best Picture. John Ford was, directed for best, was nominated for Best Director... It was also nominated for Best Cinematography and Best Film Editing. It ended up winning two Best Supporting Actor for Thomas Mitchell and Best Score. Oh, yeah, that was a good score, too. That was a really, really it good was, score. Yeah, the score was mainly a lot of old Western songs merged into one amazing soundtrack. Mm -hmm. 
that just basically brings the Old West to life. And when it comes to the American Film Institute, they needed one of the top 10 greatest Westerns ever. Yep, it's easy to understand why. I mean, even now it's still cited uh, in a lot of film theory classes. It's still cited as one of the greats. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to this movie, I mean, I, I mean, I, I never saw this movie before until this year, but my God, I really enjoyed it. This is my second time watching the movie. I, I saw it once forever ago when it was on, when it reared on PBS, and then I saw it again for this. Yeah, and John Ford, man, if it wasn't for Gone with the Wind, I think he could have maybe gotten nominated. Oh yeah, easily. He could have won Best Director. Yeah. Overall, I'll, what would you give this? This is going to be a bit controversial. I'm only going to give it a four. I'm only giving it a four. I did like it, but it's not... Again, I'm not that much of a Western guy. I didn't really... I liked the movie. I did. But it's not a kind of movie that I would go out of my way to watch. I'm giving it a four, too, because I really enjoyed this. I wouldn't mind watching it again, even though I'm not really into Westerns. Yeah, I'm not either. And there are some elements of the movie that are a bit of a yikes. Like, there is a couple of scenes that were kind of... That aged really, really poorly. Like, uh, there was a... There, there. I'm not gonna get into it. We'll talk about it later. But yeah, it's it. There are a few. There are a few movies that make me go, "Whoa, that's a bit. That's a bit much." <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was our take of Stagecoach. Now we're going ahead to 1956 with what the American Film Institute named as the greatest western ever made. And this was a film that was very. It might not have been that big back then, but now it's iconic when it comes to westerns. Yes. Especially with John Wayne. And one of perhaps one of his most iconic roles. Yes. The movie, The Searchers. Now, The Searchers is a bit of a harder movie to watch. Uh, we get John Wayne, who's the main character, who reunites with his family after seven long years fighting in the Civil American Civil War. After a quick re reuniting, he is enlisted by the Texas Rangers to go catch some Native Americans. However, it ended up being a trap, and the Native Americans ended up slaughtering the whole family and capturing their two youngest daughters. Uh, well, well, John Wayne's two youngest nephews. Nieces. Nieces, I'm sorry. Um, and so he spends the next five years hunting down the Native American tribe to, oh. to vindicate the family, but also to hopefully uh, bring their nieces home safe and sound. Yeah, well. It's a very hard story. It is. Yeah, I mean, this was dark for a Western. Yes. I didn't expect it to be that dark. Yes, it was a very, very dark film. But I can definitely see why it, the American Film Institute would rake it way up there. Yes, yes. And uh, there are some... There, a lot of, there has been quite a lot of um, co you know, conversations that have been circulated around this movie, especially when it comes to uh, uh, discussions about race and discussions about how the Old West should be portrayed. This movie was hallmark in that. You know, it was definitely one of those movies that was used to discuss those things and have healthy conversations surrounding those topics. I mean, when it comes to just racism in general, I mean, look at John Wayne's character. I mean, he is just completely racist against the Native Americans. Yes. And when, as soon as he, and, and when he finds out that his nieces are captured, he just wants to take them down one by one until he finds them. Yes, and even later in the film when he finds out that one of his nieces has been indoctrined into the culture, Complete rejection. Complete rejection. And then you have his adopted nephew, who was adopted into the family. Yes. He claims he's one eighth Native American, and at at first he is very, he's like you are not my nephew. Yes. But as the years go by, they start to form a strong bond. It's a strong bond of mutual respect. I feel like they they do butt heads a lot throughout the entire movie, like constantly butting heads even when they reunite with kind of an extended portion of the family a little bit uh, John Wayne attempts to kind of leave him behind in a few different scenarios and even put him in grave danger in a couple of scenarios without without his knowledge yeah I mean you have the and then you have the side characters like there's the Reverend that's also the captain of the Texas Rangers yep you also there's also that one guy who who is He's basically like the crazy guy who all he wants is to be in a rocking chair. Yeah, that, that'd be um, 
Moses. Yeah, Mose. Mose, yeah, Mose. Yeah, that'd be Mose. He, he ended up being instrumental in a lot of, in a good chunk of the film because he ended up being captured, but then released and was able to kind of provide information. And then you have Vera Miles as Lori, the yes. Mar Marty's girl, Marty's girlfriend. Yes. She, you can tell that she just wants to settle down, but he's, he's on, he's wanting to find his his adopted family, and she doesn't want to be left behind. Yes, you know, very much afraid of being the old maid, and even turning to being, even turning to uh, marrying a potential suitor who was part of a mariachi band. And he was also somewhere of a dimwit. Yeah, a little bit of a dimwit. Um, definitely, I, I wouldn't say he's more of a dimwit, just more of a character that you really couldn't fall for. Yeah. I mean, and then you have the fam the fa John Wayne's family. I mean, at first you can see ha how happy they are to have him back. You have the you have the youngest niece who is abducted, and like he said, she becomes part of the tribe, and John Wayne is just completely against it yes yes you know what and you know it, it, even at the peak of the movie when he goes and captures her to bring her back home you 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 were almost thinking don't do it don't do it you know in terms of like pulling the trigger and ending her um but it turned out no he he scooped her up and then took her back home you know so there is a happy ending in the movie but yes and I'm glad of that. Or yeah, else this that, would have that, been that, an extremely dark. Yeah, movie. I, like this is one of the few times where I'm gonna like, okay, just to kind of salvage this, I will spoil it. There is a happy ending. Um, so, and then you have the Native Americans because, and when it comes to their betrayal, it is aged not that good. It is not aged very well at all. There is some truth behind it. This movie was based on a couple of true stories. That happened throughout the 1800s. There yes. are some, you know, there are sightings. Uh, there are have been real encounters of Native Americans raiding a small ranch, abducting the young, and then indoctrinating them into their tribe. That has happened a couple of times. I'm pretty sure nowadays people would consider that Stockholm syndrome. Yes, yes, and uh, you know, but which, by the way, is basically when you, if any of you don't know what Stockholm syndrome is, basically it's when you start feeling a and a, a mutual attachment to your captor. You know, now, so there are some light, more lighthearted facts about this movie. Uh, the first one is that the original star was not supposed to be John Wayne. Who was it then? It was supposed to be Fess Parker, who was Davy Crockett. Ah, yes, from the, who was very popular with Disney at that time as Davy Crockett. Yes, except Disney literally said no. Walt Disney himself literally said no to Ford when, uh, when asked if they could, you know, like let him go for a while to make this movie, and Parker didn't even know about this exchange between Disney and Ford until several years later, and then later remarked that that was one of the worst career reversals that ever happened to him. Well, it was. I mean, it, he was a big star for Disney at that time. It, it was. It wasn't for him. You wouldn't have seen kids all over with those raccoon hats. Yes. Yes. So he, he, there was a there was a, there for a little moment there it would have been I, I don't John that either he was going to be a side character or the main star it does it doesn't really say he just wanted uh, Ford just wanted him to be the star of the movie one of the stars of the movie yeah this movie was also filmed in Vista Vision uh, which is very very popular style of film at the time it's analog widescreen basically sixteen yeah. by nine yeah the basic widescreen we're using right now exactly and yeah. it was very popular it originally started with paramount very it started with paramount it was used in mul many different films another film that used vista vision that a lot of the audience will know about is star wars star wars also used vista vision and along with that it was used with a lot of paramount films like it was used for the ten commandments was set from sesame de mill it was also used in a lot of Hitchcock movies like Rear Window, Vertigo, Psycho. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It's basically it was a staple in cinematography for a number of years, and this was like the key western that was able to popularize it. Yes, I mean later on you would have a lot of different westerns that would use it. I can't name any at the moment, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a very popular style of production for the time. Now, when it comes to the, when it comes to the production value, uh, well, just Second like, none. yeah, I mean, they did a, I mean, the cinematography is just beautiful. It's an amazing cinematography, and the way that the story itself unfolds, 
really uh, draws emotions out of you. You know, so it is an emotional film as well. Yeah, and here's the thing. It's supposed to take place in Texas, but they use Monument Valley as a filming location, and that's in and that's on the border of Utah and Arizona. Yeah, 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 and uh, it's kind of ironic too because it takes place shortly after the you know Civil War, and it's found that most of the people in the film are pro Confederate, which is also a little bit jarring. Yes, that is true. But also, you can tell that there's, but also when it comes to the cinematography, I mean, the colors are just so vibrant. Oh yeah. Very, very rich colors. The costume design for all for everybody was really vibrant. You know, the Native American costume set was really good. A lot of really rich reds, lots of uh, with blue laced in as well. Yeah, and then when it comes to the sets too, I mean, they do a great job of bringing the old west to life, just like they would do like almost all westerns. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, again, it goes back to Ford's experience in western. Ford, you know had been doing westerns for so long that it's basically a formality to him at this point you know where he's now doing westerns for over 30 years at this in this stage of the game yeah and uh just using monument valley as a location too i mean and he done it he used it for another color film before in 1949 he he directed a film that was shot in monument valley called she wore a yellow ribbon with john wayne yep 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 and when it comes to this film Surprisingly, it didn't get any Oscar nominations. It's easy to see why. Even now, it has aged quite poorly. Um, and there are quite a few, a large number of films that were doing really, really well at the time as well. Yeah, I mean, there was Sesame DeMille's The Ten Commandments. There was the Best Picture winner, Around the World in 80 Days. There was also the very popular music, musical film, The King and I, with Yul Brynner. Yep. And when it comes to just 1956, I mean... It was a year for those, it was the big year for those kind of epic films, and Searchers yes. wasn't quite that epic. No, it wasn't that epic at all. It was, it was very much a drama. Yeah. As far as I recall, I think it was a financial success, at least. It was a financial success, that is correct. And, when it, and like I said, the American Film Institute, they named it as the number one best Western, even beating out Gary Cooper's iconic Western, High Noon. Yeah. Now, when it, and when it comes to Stagecoach, it was always it was at number nine. Yeah. I wouldn't. Would, I wouldn't. I don't know if I would call this the greatest western. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I mean, even, even. I don't think this is even Ford's best western. I, I think Stagecoach should be put on a higher pedestal than than this. I think Stagecoach did a much better job. And when it comes to like their list of the top one hundred movies ever. It was it ranked at number twelve. Yeah, which again I I kind of disagree with. I don't think the movie. I think from a film uh, like a film history standpoint, there could be an argument to be made. But in terms of like sitting down and actually enjoying a casual movie and having fun, this isn't a movie that does that. It, it's more psychological. Yeah, exactly. I mean, with the aspects of racism, family, and. Yeah, a, a lot of hard subjects because we only scratched the surface. There's a couple other subject matters that I that we can't even talk about just because of code because just because of code of ethics. Oh yeah, definitely. With yeah. that said, what would you give this movie? I'm giving it a two, just a two point oh, just a flat two. I I can't deny its historic importance. I can't deny the conversations that the important conversations that are being had because of this movie. But. That's the only thing I'm giving it, is that it, 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 it was a hallmark in Ford's career. It started some conversations, but that's about it. I'm giving it a three and a half. Oh, you're being, okay. I mean, this could have been, I mean, I can see why a lot of people consider it the best, but it's not the best to me. I mean, no. I've seen, I mean, I saw High Noon and I really, and I enjoyed that a lot more than The Searchers. Yeah, I enjoyed Stagecoach, Union Pacific, and Iron Horse more than this. So the, I can name several Westerns that are better than this in my book. I mean, nowadays too, I mean, you have, you have now when it comes to John Ford, I mean, he could have, I get why this was considered like one of his magnum opuses, but I definitely think Stagecoach Is should take that title. I should think so as well. I think we're both in agreement about that. Yeah. So that was our take of the searchers.
For our final film, we're going ahead to 1962 with what was one of the biggest films of the 1960s. John Ford didn't direct this alone. He had two other directors with him, and according to you, they didn't get along very well. No, no, they, they did not get along at all. The two directors were Henry Hathaway and George Wallace. The film, How the West Was Won, directed by, directed by all three of them and released by MGM and Cinerama. Yes, now this is a bit of a more complex film because this movie takes place across uh, in five acts, like five major stories. Basically follows uh, the Prescott family over the course of three generations. The first act takes place kind of in the early 1830s where uh, people are starting to get over the Erie Canal and this follows the how the saga of how the Prescott family is attempting to get to the west. Unfortunately, due to some bad rapids, uh, the matriarch and patriarch of the family dies and uh, one daughter t uh, decides to stay right there while the other daughter attempts to go back east or west. She hasn't quite made up her mind yet. Uh, and it, later on, we get to see them grow, gain relationships with possible suitors. Yes, we see that in Acts 2 and 3. In the second act, we see that with, uh, in the second act, we follow one daughter who decides to go out west during the gold rush. You know, one of her suitors uh, bequeathed to her a bunch, a, a gold mine, so she goes to pursue that. In the third act, we see, the, we go back to the first daughter, the elder daughter. And her son goes into the Civil War. Mm -hmm. The third act, then the fourth act is him becoming a part of the Transcontinental Railroad. And then the fifth act is him going to find his aunt while dealing with, uh, while dealing with some robbers. All in all, this was a big film, and it has a huge cast. I mean, oh yeah. I mean, you have Debbie Reynolds, James Stewart, Gregory Peck, Robert Preston. the The film was narrated by Spencer Tracy, who was actually born here in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. This would I would call classify this movie as a superstar cast with a superstar crew. You know, uh, to say that no expense was spared is a bit of an understatement here. Um, because the, 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 how the movie how the movie got three directors was basically because it was done in five acts. It was actually originally supposed to be a TV series, and none other produced by Bing Crosby. Yes, that Bing Crosby. He got the idea for the movie by looking through some old uh, old western photos on Life magazine. So he had this idea to make this TV show, and the proceeds for that TV show were going to go to St. John's Hospital. In Los Angeles, I take it? Yes, yes. And uh, he sold the rights to MGM. He sold the rights to MGM, and MGM bought the rights to the movie, to this movie idea. And they wanted three different veterans of directors who were really well known for westerns. So they got three of the best, basically, to do bits and pieces of the movie. Um, there would be a little bit of drama with the production of the movie because for a couple of reasons. The first one is... Uh, Cinerama. No. Yes, yeah, Cinerama, if you don't know, was a camera process back then that was uh, very popular. Yes. Basically, you had three cameras being shot at one time to create a widescreen image. Yes, an ultra widescreen image that's curved. Uh, think more like those ultra wide modern gaming computer monitors. Um, computer monitors, now a lot of computer monitors will share this aspect ratio. But back then, nothing else could touch it in terms of visual fidelity. And before, and before they started doing like feature films like this, they were mainly doing documentary films. One of the biggest, some of them were some of the biggest films of the fifties, like this is Cinerama, Cinerama Holiday, Seven Wonders of the World. Yeah, and MGM was really hungry to do something like this because they had got the rights to produce four of these films, and this would be one of them. Yeah, another one from that from a year earlier was actually a, a fantasy movie called The Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm. Yes, so this would be the second in the series of four Cinerama movies that MGM would do. And when it comes to Cinerama, I mean, you can definitely tell it's shot by three different cameras. There are some points where, yes, there you could tell, but not through the fault of the cameras. Um, it's actually not the fault of the cameras. It's more along the fault of the directors and the set and the actors and actresses. See, the way that the cameras are staged means that you have, that uh, the set has to be done in an unnatural way. 
since you know you have three cameras filming at once the um you and i would have to be like a couple feet further and facing different directions but when you slice all three cameras together and post it would look natural so a lot of the actors and actresses were standing in kind of awkward positions yeah. which made it kind of you know and that kind of awkward scenario made things a little unnatural at times yeah now when it comes to the cast like i said they had a lot of oh yeah and when it comes to just i mean the first act alone you have james stewart and carol and uh, carol baker becoming a couple they definitely have some chemistry oh yeah and then in the second act it's debbie reynolds and gregory peck yep yep with robert preston as part of a love triangle mm-hmm and then in the third act, you have the, the son of Carol Baker's character going off to war. He ends up with he ends up being under the command of John Wayne. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, And then of course in the fourth one. And then in the fourth one, you had a uh, Henry Fonda as the main guy who was in charge of the railroad, but he was very harsh. Very very harsh. And then you have Debbie Reynolds returning for the final part to be with her the her character's nephew. Yes, yes, in the fifth act. You know, so a lot to unpack here. Um, yeah, when it comes to the time length, it's uh, it's about two and a half hours. It's a little over two and a half hours long. Yeah, and it takes place over the course of 50 years. You know, because we're in the 1830s at one point, and then by the end, we're in the 1880s. Yeah, and then you have Spencer Tracy as the narrator, and he basically just tells this grandiose idea of what the Old West was. And how it was conquered. Yes, and I gotta say he does an impressive narration. Oh yeah, he does. A, he did a very, very good job of the narration, and yeah. uh, it was one of my favorite aspects of the film was actually the narration. Now you can cut out a lot of the movie itself if you're like watching it back at home. You can cut it out quite a lot because there's a pretty long intermission. There's also a very long prelude. Uh, I counted about eight minutes worth of uh, uh, music intermission music. Yes, the music was courtesy of a, a big composer at that time, Alfred Newman. Oh yeah. Along with Ken Darby, and I, I definitely really think they did an awesome job with the score. They did a very good job with the score, but you know, if you're trying just to watch the movie itself, it is something that you can skip. Yes, well, along with that, like I said, John Ford only directs one part, the Civil War, but it you can definitely tell it has his touch to it. Oh yes. Um, However, it was the least popular touch out of the whole movie because a couple of the other directors thought that it felt kind of more staged and a little bit stiff. Um, in fact, it's cited that Ford hated the camera technology at the time because of how he had to do things. He hated how he couldn't do a shoulder shot, for example. It was very difficult to do a yeah. shoulder shot. And this was one of the last films he directed before he retired. Yeah, you know, he just, by this point in the game, he's been at it for over 40 years you know so technology was starting to get to him a little bit at this point in the game yeah and then when it comes to henry hathaway he like i said he direct directed three parts and he does a pretty good job very very good job i mean when it comes to that first that first part alone i mean you have that you have that whole scene with them be, with the fight between james stewart and the con artist and then you had that whole sequence with the family going down the rapids. Oh yeah, very, very well done. Yeah, the editing that is pretty, is really good. Yep, and then of course you have the, uh, some good train, good old fashioned train scenes, even a train robbery, who doesn't like a good old train robbery? Yes, the, and the cinematography, I mean, when it comes to Cinerama, I, I think this was amazing. It was very well done. Um, the only downside of Cinerama was its translation into modern media. You know, it, 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 up until very, very recently, it's just been pan and scan letterbox, and a lot of complaints have been that you can't distinguish the actors and actresses' faces uh, on the wide shots at all because of how much, how many pixels were crammed into those movies back then. Uh, and it wasn't until Blu-ray had gotten to the stage where you can get big, giant widescreen TVs that technology finally caught up to the film form, film form act, the yeah. film form factor. Ugh, say that ten times fast. Yeah, well. The only way you'd be able to actually see this film at its best is if you actually were at a Cinerama theater. Yeah. One left, I think. There's one left, I think. There used to be a one in L.A., but I think it was shut down. Yes, during COVID. Yes. Now, when it comes to just production, 
I mean, this was a big film. It was a big film. It was a lethargic. It was very Lombard. It was very cumbersome to film. Um, it actually, because of how complicated and expensive it got, they were thinking about axing the fifth segment towards the end because it was going so over budget. And the directors all, like everybody got together and actually put it to a vote. And it was finally decided that they'll include the fifth act. The fifth act was nicknamed um, uh, The Law, I think it was. Yeah. And the reason, and they were like, nope, we gotta keep that in because you can't win the West until Law has been put onto it. Oh yeah, that sounds right. Yep, that was the general consensus. And, and the main theme too is like, and when it comes to like the whole theme of the movie, it's that whole idea of us conquering the West. Yes. I mean, the, I mean it, was a, it was a wilderness to, to settlers who, mm -hmm. who came to America, and it was basically like entering another world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you see that world change throughout the movie, too, into something that becomes more familiar. Like, there's scenes in St. Louis, and it, the scenes from St. Louis make, you know, really put you into that small-town America feel. Like, you can definitely see the remnants of small-town America in the scenes with St. Louis. Yeah, and then right at the finale, you have Spencer Tracy talking about like how the West was won and how it would progress into like the modern society we know as today with interstates, and you see a camera going right under the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Yep, yep. And this was a huge hit at the box office. Oh, yeah. It was number two in the 1963 box office, right behind Liz Taylor's Cleopatra, and that didn't even break even. That no. was a flop. No, no, that was a flop, but this one, again, this was more of a popular movie because it was a bit more expensive to go to a Cinerama movie back then. It was more of a spectacle. Uh, and there was even some drama with the release of the film, too, because we mentioned how St. John, the prophets of, Saint, of the movie, were supposed to go to St. John's. Initially, it didn't, and St. John's actually had to sue MGM to get at least a cut of the profits of the movie, so it did make money. Well, do you know like how much cash they got from the from the lawsuit? It was not specified. I'm sure a quick Google search can solve this. Yeah. Well, I also know that the Oscars it, it received eight nominations, including Best Picture, Best Original Score, Best Cinematography. It ended up winning three: Best Original Screenplay, Best Film Editing, and Best Sound. Yes, I would bet that the editing and sound has to do more mainly with the technology than the actual like way things were done because again very new technology kind of personally i think this should have personally i think it should have won for cinematography oh yeah the winner of that year was cleopatra crime that's a crime i i, I agree i think that this movie should have definitely won that because just the nature of the cameras themselves really are supposed to showcase wide angle shots in fact there was even a general rule for the movie film as much outdoors as possible they wanted to get as many outdoor grand shots as possible throughout the movie. And I don't blame, I mean, those wide shots of Monument Valley at the end. Oh yeah. They wanted, and, and when it comes to just Monument Valley in general, I mean, personally I wanna go there. That's on my bucket list thanks oh, yeah. to these movies. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know, the, the best way to view it is through this movie, I think. You know, especially now since technology's gotten good enough where we can actually enjoy it, the movie for what it was meant to be enjoyed as. Yeah. When it comes to the film American Film Institute, I found out that when it comes to the film score, it, it just made it into their list of the top 25 film scores. Oh, I'm going to say 23, because that's my favorite number. Actually, it was 25. Darn! <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, personally, this movie was definitely a lot better than The Searchers in my book. It was. It was definitely a lot better. Even if it was longer, I still enjoyed it, especially with all the cast. I mean... A lot of them were big celebrities of that time. I mean, James Stewart, I mean, he had already done a lot of Westerns. Now, do you think that this movie may have suffered from too many cooks in the kitchen syndrome? We have three directors after all, and from all accounts, the production of the movie was, again, a real pain in the arse. Hmm. You know, so I think that some, uh, I think that some aspects of the movie, while on the surface may have suffered a little bit because of too many cooks in the kitchen syndrome. Hmm. Well, I know I can understand why they kept butting heads. I mean, when it comes 
a lot of them were veteran directors. It was, it was a time, it was starting to, when it comes to the film industry, it was starting to change. It was around the, it was around the time when the Hollywood new wave would happen yep. with yep. the next generation. I, I think I can understand why you say that, but I still enjoyed this movie. It's still an enjoyable movie, you know, but I do think that there are some aspects that could have been done better. And I think part of that is partly due because of the lack of knowledge with Cinemarama. And another part of it is because uh, a lot of the uh, cast and crew and also the yeah. uh, producers were button heads so much. Yeah, I mean, this was around the twilight era of Cinemarama. They would stop using it by the end of the 60s. Yeah. I mean, it was a big fad, but basically it was a fad of that time. It was a fad. It was it, popular, but then... It, when you study mid-century modern America, the Cinerama is one of the phrases that gets thrown around along with New Way Forward and, and Nuclear Family. It's one of the, it's one of the phrases, pop, most popular phrases, and like baths that, of the era. And uh, there was, more, along with that, there was also a lot more widescreen processes that were being used that yep. didn't have to include three cameras at once. Nope, Vista Vision 1. Vista Vision 1 for obvious reasons. And then there was also Cinemascope, mm -hmm. Technorama. IMAX later on. That was much later on, but it did yeah. come later on. Yeah, well, all in all, what would you give this movie? I think I'm going to give it the highest score today. 3.5. I think I'm going to... No, I gave a movie 4.0 earlier, didn't I? 3.5. I'll give it a 4, because I really enjoy this film. Yeah, I did too. I mean, it's definitely a lot better than The Searchers in my book, and personally, I think this should have been on the, that list for the top 10 best... Uh, I don't know about that. Expect you know. I think that because um, this movie was more, all, I would say, a historical showcase than an actual movie. Because it is, it's a historical showcase, and it was originally meant for me a TV show. Yeah, I also found out that this movie was actually became a novelization. Oh it, yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was actually novelized by a very popular Western author of that time, Louis L'Amour. Yeah. And you can and. If you go to bookstores, you can see like a whole bookshelf full of some of his books. Mm -hmm. He was like the Western author of that time. Yeah, and it's an, it's an easy subject to make into a novelization. And just think, it started off as a magazine, a few photos in a magazine. That's how this that's how this movie came to be. Yeah, well, and there are so many hands on this movie. Literally, all hands on deck situation. Yeah, and. Like I said, after the, a, a few years later, John Ford would retire. Mm -hmm. He would have four Oscars for Best Director under his belt, and no one has beaten that since. No. Not even Steven Spielberg or any other big directors. No. I think in summary, I think what can be said here is if you really want to get into Westerns, you want to, the two names that you need to search for when you're looking at getting into the Western film genre is Ford and Wayne. You want a Ford-Wayne film. Basically, is the TLDR. Is that's kind of like the cheater way of saying how do I get into westerns? Up, oh, you just go with the Ford Wayne film. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to John Wayne, I mean, he would do westerns all the way up to the past the seventies. Yes, yes. He, he would only win one Oscar in his entire career, and it wasn't even from a film directed by John Ford. It was for the nineteen sixty nine western True Grit. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, which you know spawns its own kind of genre of westerns that survive today. Is the, the grit genre. Uh, is a subgenre of westerns that still survives now. I mean, you have the remake of True Grit from 2010, and that was a huge hit with the mm -hmm. Oscar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and nowadays you would have, like, say, The Power of the Dog. Yes, or the, uh, what was it, Miraculous Eight? The Hateful Eight. The Hateful Eight. That's another one. Yeah, Quentin Tarantino's film. Mm -hmm. So all in all, that was our take of John Ford movies. Now, next episode... It's holiday season, so we're getting ready for Christmas. <laughs> we're going to be looking at four films that you might know. And I bet there's at least one film that you haven't seen. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, until well, next week. <laughs> yeah, until next time, I'm Chris Wyatt. And I'm Jacob Nemuth. And thank you very much for watching Chris's Classic Cinema. Hope you have a nice holiday until then.